bow your heads and we'll have a word of prayer for Jimmy. <clears throat> Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, one of your dear children is not feeling good right now, Lord, and we, I don't know full details of what's wrong with him, Lord, but I just pray that you'll be with him now. Send your angels to be around him to comfort him, even though he may be feeling pain, Lord. I just pray that you'll send your healing hand upon him to strengthen him, Lord, and to heal him, Lord. We know you have the healing power, and I just pray that you be with him and, and the doctors that look at him today, Lord. So we thank you for your hearing pa healing power and for your love. And Lord, we pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning again. And happy Sabbath. Well, I hope y'all are as excited about hearing BBOS Part 3 as I am about sharing with you, because I just can't wait to continue our story. <clears throat> now you see, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, I've been giving a multiple-part series here titled BBOS, which stands for The Bible Blueprint of Salvation. And today I'll be giving the third part of the series. Now, if you've missed part one or part two, I would strongly encourage you, when you get time, to go to YouTube, search Malvern SDA, pull up the church's YouTube page, and watch BBOS part one and BBOS part two. But for today, if you missed one or both parts, I would str uh, don't worry about it because I plan on doing a very thorough review once again to cover everything that we've looked at so far in this series. So I want to have a prayer. I want to have a prayer here in just a moment, and I want to have a review. And I, I want to spend about 15 minutes on review. And I do apologize for spending so much time on a review, but I think it's very important that we understand this BBOS story in its complete entire context. So let's have a prayer, and then we'll have our review, and then we'll jump right into BBOS part three. Are y'all with me? All right, good. Please bow your heads and we'll have a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you'll be with us today. Send your Spirit into our minds, into our hearts, to, to help us to see and understand Scripture, Lord. We know we can't understand spiritual things without your Holy Spirit guiding us. So this morning, I pray that you'll reveal to us how you've led us in the past and how you're going to reveal to, uh, lead us in the future, Lord. We know that you're with us and we know that your Word is a living the living Bible, Lord, and we know that it has truths that we need to know and understand to guide our lives, Lord. So I pray that you'll be with us now. Help us to understand. Help us to, to understand how history has been fulfilled and how the Bible predicted it, Lord, and how you always have us safely where you want us and that you have planned for, to redeem us, Lord. We pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ, holy name. Amen. All right, we started with BBOS part one. If I can get this going. The Great Controversy. How many of y'all were here for BBOS Part 1? Okay, that was quite, like nine months ago, and I apologize for these parts being so far apart. Hopefully Part 4 will be in four weeks. So write that down on your schedules in four weeks. Hopefully we'll have Part 4. But we saw in BBOS Part 1, The Great Controversy, that there was a war that started in heaven, and it continues on our earth today. And this battle is over one particular thing, and that is God's law. We saw that G God appointed an angel named Lucifer to the position of an anointed covering cherubim. And we learned that Lucifer's responsibility in this role was to cover or protect two things. Does anybody remember what those two things were that Lucifer was supposed to cover or protect? The throne of God and the law of God. The very law that establishes God's authority in heaven. The very law that the Bible says Lucifer eventually began to transgress or disobey. And unfortunately, he wasn't alone in his rebellion against God's law. The Bible says he convinced one-third of all the angels in heaven to rebel against God's law with him. And the results were not good. The Bible says that there was war in heaven. It was Michael and his angels versus Lucifer, the dragon, and his angels. And the Bible says they prevailed not and there was no longer a place found in heaven for them. And eventually they were kicked out of heaven. But before God kicked them out of heaven, he told them something very interesting. He told them he was going to take them he was going to lay them at the feet of kings to be judged. Now what's interesting about this is the fact that all heaven was divided into two groups. Where was God going to find a neutral, unbiased third party to determine who was right and who was wrong in this great heavenly controversy? And we saw that that's where we came in at. We saw that God created humanity, among other reasons, to be like jurors in this great heavenly controversy. And you see, when God created Adam and Eve, He gave them some very interesting characteristics. The Bible says that He created us in His image to look like Him, and He also gave us His likeness or His character. And last time in part one we looked and we saw that there are many different texts in the Bible that define characters, characteristics for God. And we also saw something very interesting. We saw that each one of these characteristics that are used to define God are also the exact same characteristics that are used to define God's law. So we came to the conclusion that God's character and God's law are synonymous with each other. So when the Bible says that we were created in His likeness, 
It simply means that from the very beginning, God created us to be law-abiding citizens, fully capable of determining between right and wrong, fully qualified to be jurors in this great heavenly controversy, this battle over God's law. Now, it didn't take long for Lucifer to realize that Adam and Eve were these kings that were going to be used to judge him. So he did what any logical being would do in his situation. He began to bribe the juror the jury. He realized if he could convince Adam and Eve to disobey God's law and commit sin, then they would no longer be qualified to judge in matters of God's law. And that's exactly what he successfully ended up doing. You see, he used deception. He's deceived Adam and Eve into di directly disobeying God by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did this, sin entered into the human race. And so it was from this point on, all humanity has been plagued with the disease of sin. We lost our credibility to be qualified jurors in this great heavenly controversy. In BBOS Part 2, The Sanctuary Blueprint, we saw that God had a plan to redeem us, to restore us back to what He created us to be, back to being law-abiding citizens, back to having sound judgment capable of determining between right and wrong, back to being kings of this earth and qualified jurors in this great heavenly controversy. And God began to reveal His plan of redemption or salvation to us through something called the Sanctuary. And we saw in BBOS Part 2 that God instructed Moses to have the Israelites build Him a sanctuary so that He could do what? Does anybody remember? So he could dwell among them. Alright, I just want to make sure y'all were with me. So you see, he had them build this sanctuary. When he had them build this sanctuary, he gave them a, a very specific pattern, a blueprint, to have them build this sanctuary. And you see, after they built this sanctuary on earth, it turns out that the sanctuary on earth was none other than a replica, a miniature model of the sanctuary in heaven. And the Bible says that everything in this heavenly sanctuary was a shadow or an example of heavenly things. And we looked at this sanctuary and we saw that it was divided into three compartments. You had the outer courtyard, and then you had the holy place, and then you had the most holy place. And within this sanctuary structure were different articles of furniture. And each one of these articles of furniture has a, each one of them represented a different function, a purpose in God's plan of salvation. And we also saw that each one of these articles of furniture was placed in the exact location based off of this blueprint, this pattern that God gave them to build this sanctuary. And you remember I told you we can see this blueprint pattern not just in the building of the sanctuary, but we also can see this blueprint pattern throughout the stories and the lessons and the pages of the Bible. And we looked at many examples. I showed you that Jesus followed this blueprint pattern in His life from His baptism until His ascension into heaven. We also saw that the crucifixion of Jesus followed this blueprint pattern. We also saw that God leading the Israelites out of Egyptian captivity followed the blueprint pattern. In fact, we even saw that the New Testament Scriptures, the way they are put in the order in our Bibles and the way we read them today, follows this exact same blueprint pattern. Now, if you're wondering what in the world am I talking about, you've got to go back and watch BBOS Part 2 because I just don't have time to explain it again. But I would like to run through the sanctuary again and refresh everybody's memory on what each article of furniture represents. So we'll start in the outer courtyard. The first article of furniture was the altar of sacrifice. And this is where they would bring unblemished animals and they would sacrifice them daily for the sins of the people. But you see, these sacrifices were merely substitutes pointing forward to Jesus' death on the cross. You see, Jesus came to this earth, He bore our sins in His body, and He died on the cross for our sins. Jesus fulfilled the altar of sacrifice. The next article of furniture is the laver. You see, the laver was where the priests would come and they had washed their hands and feet and they would become ceremonially cleansed before they could enter into the holy compartment, the holy place. And I want to make a correction right here for my last presentation. Last time I mistakenly said that they washed their hands in the laver itself, but that's not entirely true. What the Bible says is they washed themselves there at the laver, presumably in something other than the laver, because the laver itself was never contaminated. But nevertheless, this washing or cleansing at the laver is symbolic of the act of baptism. You say when we're baptized, we become spiritually cleansed. So after this cleansing process at the laver, then the priest could safely enter into the holy compartment. And inside this holy compartment, there were three different articles of furniture. And the first article of furniture was the table of showbread. And you see, the table of showbread was a symbolic representation of the Bible, the Word of God. You see, the Bible is often referred to as the bread of life, because just as we need to eat bread or food daily to stay alive physically, we also need to be studying the Word of God daily to stay alive spiritually. The Bible is spiritual food for our spiritual nourishment. 
Also in the holy place is the altar of incense. And the altar of incense is where the priest would light the incense, and then the smoke of the incense would ascend up into the air. And it would go to the ceiling of the holy place, and then the smoke would go over the veil and fill up the most holy place. And the Bible says that this incense was a sweet, sweet aroma to the Lord. But you see, this incense was merely symbolic of our prayers. You see, when we offer our prayer, our prayer sends up into the heavenly sanctuary. And it fills God's throne room in the heavenly sanctuary. And He loves to hear our prayers. Our prayers are a sweet, sweet blessing to the Lord. And then the last article of furniture in the holy place is the seven-branch candlestick. Now this represents God's people letting their light shine to the world. You see, light is symbolic of knowledge. In this case, it's the knowledge of the glory of God. You see, when you spend time studying the Word of God daily, table of showbread, and you spend time praying to God daily, altar of incense, the natural result is you're going to develop a holy relationship with God. And as you develop this holy relationship, the Holy Spirit's going to come into you. And the Holy Spirit's going to set you on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just like the seven-branch candlestick, once it's lit, it can't help but to illuminate everything around it. So you too, once the Holy Spirit comes into you, you can't help but to share the knowledge of the glory of God to everybody you come in contact with. You become like the seven-branch candlestick. And notice, it's not a coincidence, this coincidence that this candlestick has seven branches. You see, God never intended us to let our light shine just one day a week, probably when we go to church. You see, God wants us to be a witness to the knowledge of the glory of God seven days a week. And you see, just like the services were performed on a daily basis in the holy place, each one of these articles of furniture represents something that we need to be doing daily in our own personal lives. We need to be studying the Word of God daily, table of showbread. We need to be praying to God daily, altar of incense. We need to be a light to the world, be a witness to everybody we come around daily on a daily basis. So we should be doing these three things on a daily basis. Amen. And then that brings us to the last article of furniture is found in the most holy place. And this is the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, the mercy seat sat directly on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat, we learned in BBS Part 1, was a symbolic representation of what? The throne of God. And remember, the mercy seat, directly beneath the mercy seat, was inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. This was symbolizing the fact that the foundation of God's throne in heaven is His law. Anytime we see the altar, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, it's a symbolic representation of God's authority, God's law, or God's judgment. Now hopefully you can see this blueprint progression in regards to the Christian experience each step. The ultimate goal is to point us back to keeping God's law, God's Ten Commandments. Now many Christians who have never seen or understood this blueprint before and have ne never completely, completely understood this great controversy mistakenly believe that when Jesus died on the cross that he completely did away with his law or at least our requirement to keep that law. But this just simply doesn't make any sense if you think about it. Why would God get rid of the very law that Lucifer and his angels rebelled against in heaven? The very law that they claimed was not necessary in the first place. I mean, if God were to remove his law or anyone's requirement to keep that law, then he would be in essence agreeing with Lucifer that it wasn't necessary. The whole idea that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, therefore we're no longer obligated to keep God's law. This does not sound like a teaching from God, but it does sound very familiar if you've been following along our story. It sounds just like the same lie that Lucifer told all the angels in heaven, the same lie that he told to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You don't have to obey God's law. God's just keeping you from achieving a higher level, from having more fun in your life. You see, the devil absolutely hates this blueprint because it's the very thing that points us back to fully keeping God's law, God's Ten Commandments, which will restore us back to being qualified jurors in this great heavenly controversy. And you see, the devil will do anything in his power to prevent, prevent us from being qualified to judge him. So now that we've reviewed this blueprint and we have a better understanding of this blueprint again and we understand this great controversy now let's catch up on the uh, context of our story and remember God after God led the Israelites out of Egyptian captivity led them across the Red Sea and into the wilderness and it was in this wilderness that he gave them his holy sanctuary and it was through the sanctuary that he began to reveal his plan of redemption or salvation to his people and it didn't take long for Lucifer to realize that they, they had to do something about this sanctuary, this blueprint, and about these Israelites, God's people. They had to destroy them both, and that's exactly what they sought out to do. Through the influence of demonic angels, they began to introduce sin and idolatry among God's people. Eventually, they led the Israelites into worshiping other gods. And then eventually, they completely ignored God and His law. And as a result, God had to allow the uh, Israelites to fall back into captivity once again. This time, they were conquered by the great city of the great... Uh, nation of Babylon. You see the Babylonians marched in to Jerusalem. 
They burned down the city, they destroyed the blueprint, the sanctuary, and they took God's people captive. You see, the devil thought he had won. He had conquered God's people. He had destroyed the sanctuary blueprint. But you see, this is a lesson for us. God never, ever leaves us in the dark. And before he allowed this to happen, he revealed to his prophet Jeremiah that this was going to take place. And he revealed to him that this Babylonian captivity was going to last 70 literal years. And we saw in this 70 years... God was going to call upon another faithful servant and prophet, a man named Daniel. God called upon Daniel to rekindle hope and commitment among God's people, the Israelites, once again. Because, you see, God was going to use the Israelites again. This time he was going to use them to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah, the one who prophecy said would come and set up an everlasting kingdom. And it was through a series of visions that Daniel, that God began to reveal to Daniel prophetic events that were going to take place in the future. And three of those prophecies that Daniel had in his time are very crucial for us to understand in our time. These three prophecies in chronological order are the 70-week prophecy, the 1260-day prophecy, and the 2300-day prophecy. Now in BBOS Part 2, we looked in depth at this 70-week prophecy. And first of all, we saw that the 70 prophetic weeks was the equivalent of 490 literal years using the day for a year principle that we discovered. And you see in this 490 years God gave the Israelites this amount of time to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. And there in, in this 400 year, 490 year period we saw that it began when the decree went forth by King Artaxerxes in 457 BC to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And so it was from 457 BC 490 years later brought us to 34 AD. And within this time period, the Bible predicted the very year that Jesus would be baptized and start his earthly ministry. It also predicted the very year that Jesus would be crucified on the cross for our sins as our sacrificial lamb. And you see, at the end of this 70-week prophecy, not only did the Israelites fail to prepare the world for Jesus' coming, but they were also the very ones that were responsible for having him crucified. And then the ultimate rejection, the ultimate sign that Israel failed this 70-week prophecy came in 34 AD, the last year of this 70, 490 years. And in 34 AD, they stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr, the first person that was killed for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very gospel that God had called the Israelites themselves to preach. And so we saw that the Israelites failed this mis miserably, what God had called them to prepare the world for the Messiah. And when, after they failed this 70-week prophecy, we, we noticed some changes, some, a lot of major changes took place at this time. Two of them are very crucial for us to understand as we continue our story. One change is we saw that after the Israelites had failed, no longer were they considered God's chosen people. You see, now God's people were the Christians, those who had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And you see, just as the Israelites were uh, blessed through God, through a promise to Abraham, it's also because of our relationship with Jesus Christ that we can receive the promise of eternal life through Jesus' death. And you see, there was another major change. After Jesus died on the cross, you see, everything in the article, or every article of furniture in the sanctuary on earth, the sanctuary on earth was pointing forward to Jesus' death on the cross. And you see, when Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled everything that the sanctuary on earth was pointing forward to. And the Bible tells us after Jesus died, he res resurrected three days later, and then eventually ascended up to heaven. And then when he got to heaven, the Bible tells us that he entered into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and he began to do a work for us as our heavenly high priest. And we're going to look at that in much more detail later on in this series. So you see, the devil realized that these changes were taking place. He realized that the sanctuary on earth was no longer a threat to him. And he realized that the Israelites, the Jews, were no longer a threat to him. And he switched his tactics. He began to focus on the sanctuary in heaven. He began attacking the sanctuary in heaven. And he began attacking the Christians. And you see, for a period, about 300 years, the beginning of Christianity, the devil brought mass persecution upon the Christians. And he began to persecute and persecute, and it just climaxed and got more and more and more. But you see, he realized that this wasn't working. The more he persecuted the Christians, the more the Christian faith grew. One author said that the blood of the Christians in the floor of the Colosseums, remember they were throwing the Christians to the lions and feeding them. He said the blood of the Christians in the Colosseum was like seed for the Christian faith. The more they, crucified, or more they persecuted the Christians, the more the Christian faith grew. You see, the devil realized that this persecution thing, it just wasn't working. So he had to change his tactics. And he, he went to a tactic that all of us should be very familiar with. If we can't beat them, 
join them. You see, the devil created this enormous power known as the little horn power in, in the chapters of Daniel. And he said he used this little horn power to attack the sanctuary in heaven and to attack God's people. And he did this by joining the Christian church with this little horn power. And this brings us to where we left off in BBOS part two. And now we are ready to start BBOS part three. Are y'all ready? All right, good. So BBOS part three, <clears throat> we can learn more about this little horn power and its purpose in our next time prophecy, which is the 1260 year prophecy, which we can read about in Daniel chapter seven, verse 25. It says, and he shall speak great words against the most high, and he shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So we can see right here very clearly where this little horn power is getting its power from. In fact, we can see the whole entire great contro controversy summed up in this one verse. Do you all see it? Do you remember what started this great controversy to begin with? Remember, Lucifer in heaven, he rebelled against God's law. And then he started spreading rumors about the character of God. He began telling lies about God. He attacked God's character. And then eventually he started a war in heaven and he began to attack God's people. We see the same threefold attack right here by this little horn power. It says he speaks great words against the Most High. That's an attack on God's character. Wear out the saints of the Most High. That is an attack on God's people. And it says that he will think to change times and laws. That is clearly an attack on God's law. You see, ever since the very beginning of this great controversy, the devil has been doing the same threefold attack. He attacked God's character, God's people, God's law in heaven. He attacked God's character, God's people, God's law in the Garden of Eden. He attacked God's character, God's people, and God's law throughout the history of the Israelites. We see this little horn power is going to attack God's character, God's people, God's law during the early stages of the Christian church. And my friends, we would be very naive and gullible if we didn't believe that even today the devil is doing the same threefold attack. Today the devil is attacking God's character, God's people, and God's law. And we're going to look at that in a lot more detail at the end of this series. But you see that we also see our next time prophecy in the same verse. It says that this little horn power will be giving, given authority for a time and times and the dividing of time. Now for us to understand this threefold equation, we need to understand exactly what a time is. And you see a time is a biblical measurement of one biblical year. And we get that a biblical year, according to the Genesis account of the flood, is 360 days. So if a time is 360 days, then that means we have a time, 360, and then we have a times, which is just two times, which would be 720 days, and then we have a dividing of time, or half of 180, which would be I'm uh, sorry, half of 360, which would be 180. So if we add those three together, we get, a, we get 1,260 prophetic days. And then these are prophetic days, so we do use our day for a year principle, and this converts to 1,260 literal days that this little horn power is going to have the authority and power to attack God's people and God's blueprint. Now, before we go any farther understanding this little horn power or this 1260-year prophecy, I want to back up a little bit. I want to examine Daniel chapter 7. It's in complete and entire concept, uh, context because I believe it's very crucial that we understand exactly where this little horn power comes from in the time period when it comes on the scene. And to do that, we need to go back all the way back to verse 1 of Daniel chapter 7. So let's read verses 1 through 3. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of the heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. So you see here, the time was 553 B.C., the first year of the reign of King Belshazzar of Babylon. And during this year, the Bible tells us that Daniel had a vision. And in this vision, he saw four great beasts rising up out of the sea. Now I want to stop right there and give everybody a warning of caution. When studying the prophecies of the Bible, we need to be very careful not to allow our mind to run wild because the Bible contains a lot of unrealistic imagery within these prophecies. But you see, the biblical world would be a whole lot 
less confusing if people would just stick to one simple rule. And that rule is simply to allow the Bible to interpret itself. You see, if you keep reading this chapter, Daniel 7, when you get to verses 17 and 23, it's going to tell us very clearly who these four beasts represent and where they come from. Verse 17 says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. It also says in verse 23, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So we can see very clearly by these two verses that these four beasts that come up out of his dream, out of the sea, are actually four kings or kingdoms that will arise from the earth. Now what we see here in this prophecy of Daniel chapter 7 is that the Bible predicted the rise and fall of every major world power over a 1500 year period with very extreme detail. Now we're only going to look at this 1500 year period in these four kingdoms from the context of Daniel chapter 7. But I just want you to know that there are also many more details about this in different places in the Bible. But we're only going to focus on Daniel chapter 7 for now. So anyway, let's take a look at these four beasts. The first beast we can read about in Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. It says, The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So we see here this first beast is a, described as a lion with eagle's wings. Now traditionally speaking, it was the nation of Babylon that was often referred to as a lion. Even the prophet Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah refers to Babylon as the lion. And you see, during excavations of Babylonian ruins, archaeologists uncovered statues and other artifacts that contained lions with eagles' wings on them. And you see, it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to apply this beast, this lion with eagles' wings, to the kingdom of Babylon because we just saw that Babylon was the kingdom that was in power when Daniel had this vision. And it would only make sense that the first beast would be the vision that was in power at that time. Now, if what I said isn't enough to you, just flip to Daniel chapter 8, and it says very clearly this first beast is Babylon. So let's look at the next beast. This next beast is Daniel 7, 5. It says, And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So you see this bear had three ribs in its mouth. Now think about this. If if a kingdom is referred to as a beast, and then if a beast dies, what's left? Its bones. Now the fact that this bear has three ribs in his mouth signifies the fact that this Medo-Persian Empire, you see, we learned last time, and I forgot to tell you that this was the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, we learned last time that it was the Medo-Persian Empire that came into Babylon and t took control of Babylon. And you see, they were the next power that were to come on the scene. And we can see here clearly that this bear raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth is the Medo-Persian Empire. And you see, the Bible predicted that the Medo-Persian Empire would have three great victories. And you see, these three rep ribs in its mouth represent these three conquests that they had. You see, they conquered the great city of Lydia in 546 B B.C. They conquered Egypt, I'm sorry, they conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. And they conquered Egypt in 535 B.C. Now, it says that this bear was raised up on one side. Now, this signifies the fact that there were two sides to this nation, this power. As we can see, the Medo-Persian Empire had two sides. Now, if I were to ask any of you if you are more familiar with the Persian Empire or the Median Empire, I imagine everybody in here would probably say they're more familiar with the Persian Empire, right? Not many of us have heard of the Median Empire unless you studied history deeply. But you see, the Bible draws out the fact that the Persian Empire was much more dominant than the Median Empire because this bear was raised up on one side. So we can clearly see this bear raised up on one side with three ribs in his mouth is a symbolic representation of the Medo-Persian Empire. So and if that information that I shared with you is not enough, once again turn to Daniel chapter 8 and it says very clearly that the next beast that comes after Babylon is the Medo-Persian Empire. Okay, so now let's look at the third beast. This third beast is a leopard with four heads and four wings. It says, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. You see, this leopard here with four heads and four wings. Now we have the privilege of studying this prophecy in hindsight. All we have to do is look in history, and we see that it was the Greece Empire that came into power after the Medo-Persian Empire. And if anybody studied the Greece Empire, you probably remember a man by the name of Alexander the Great. How many of y'all remember the Alexander the Great? Does anybody in here remember what made Alexander so great? Yeah, I mean, for somebody to carry the title of great more than 2,000 years after his death, he must have done something pretty impressive, don't you think? 
What made Alexander so great was the fact that his army, he led his army to such a fast uh, conquest of the then known world. And you see in Bible prophecy, wings are symbolic of speed. And just as the lion of Babylon had two wings, this leopard has four wings, signifying the fact that the uh, Greece Empire conquered its ter tw territory twice as fast as the Medo-Persian, I'm sorry, as the uh, Babylon Empire did. It also says that this leopard had four heads. Now, it's interesting that uh, Alexander the Great divided his territory into four territories, and then he assigned one of his generals to each territory. These four heads represent the four generals of Alexander's army. And you see, the story tells us, history tells us that after Alexander had conquered the then known world by the age of 29, he became depressed that there was no more battles to be fought. Now, I personally don't know why anybody would become depressed because there was no more battles. I guess he liked the prestige and the power that came from each victory. You see, he had over 39 victories, major military victories, in a 12-year period. And you see, uh, excuse me, Those, history tells us that on Alexander the Great's deathbed, all four of his generals were present. And one of his generals asked, who becomes heir of the kingdom? And then Alexander the Great uttered those famous words, to the strongest. And you see, this caused a civil war between the four generals of Greece, the four territories. And just like any civil war, when people start fighting amongst themselves, this is a lesson for church congregations as well, when you start fighting amongst yourselves, that opens up the door for somebody else to come in. And unfortunately, that's the devil when it comes to the church. But anyway, this opened the way for our next beast, the final beast, which we can read in verse 7. It says, After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So you see, Daniel, after he saw this fourth beast, his dream quickly turned into something more like a nightmare. The words he used to describe this fourth beast were dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. Now, all we've got to do is look back in history and we see that it was the kingdom of Rome that came into power after the Greece Empire. And if anybody has studied Roman history, we see that they were very strong and very fierce and they devoured, they destroyed anything and everything that got in their way. And the fact that the Bible describes this fourth beast as having iron teeth is quite significant because, you see, what gave Rome its uh, victory to win in battle was the use of their iron chariots and their iron weaponry. And you see, the period of the Iron Age started at the exact same time that Rome came into power. It also says that this fourth beast was diverse from all the other beasts. You see, unlike, uh, Rome, unlike the other three beasts, the three nations, they were all conquered by another nation. Rome was never conquered by anybody else. In fact, something else happened to Rome. You see, a strange occurrence happened. Around the 400th century, migrations of people came swarming in to the Roman Empire. And you see, the Bible says that this beast had ten horns. Now I want to show you from history, I want to took a little clip from Wikipedia so you can see I'm not making this up. It says this migration period was a period during the decline of the Roman Empire around the 4th to 6th century AD in which there were widespread migrations of people within or into Europe, mostly into Roman territory, notably German, Germanic tribes and Huns. It continues to say that the first migrations of people were made by the Germanic tribes such as the Goths, including the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, the Anglo-Saxons, the Lombards, the Subai, the Frizi, the Utes, the Burgundies, the Almani, the Siri, and the Franks. So you see these massive tribes of people came flowing into Rome. And as they flowed into Rome, they came together and they formed ten kingdoms. You see, the, the Frizi joined the Anglo-Saxons, and the J Utes joined the Visigoths, and the Siri joined the Subai. But there were four kingdoms that were established out of this migration. And you see, the Bible predicted this by these little horn by these little horns that came out of the beast. You see in Daniel 24 it says, the ten horns out of the, this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise from the earth. So we see the Bible predicted that not only would Rome be this fourth beast, but that these ten kingdoms would come out of Rome. And it would, they would establish uh, rulership, they would set up their own armies. They became kings within the Roman territory. Now this brings us to verse 8. And we see in verse 8 it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So now we're back to this little horn power. And you see, now that we're back to this little horn power, and we saw that Babylon 
was the lion and then we saw that the bear was Medo-Persia and that Greece was represented by the leopard and that Rome was this fourth beast and then these kingdoms came out of Rome and then the Bible tells us that out of these ten kingdoms came this little horn power. Now we have a good understanding of this little horn power. Let's start looking at it and see if we can uncover who this little horn power is. Daniel 7, 8 continues to say, I considered the horns, the ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Now if you pluck something up by the roots, what happens? If I take a plant out of the ground and pluck it up by the roots, it's not coming back. It's completely destroyed, right? You see, this little horn power is going to pluck up three of these ten kingdoms. Now if we examine the history of these ten kingdoms, we see that the Anglo-Saxons became England, France, or Franks became France, Burgundies became Switzerland, Visigoths became Spain, Almani became Germany, Subai became Portugal, Lombards became Italy. But as for these other three kingdoms, just like the Bible predicted, they were all destroyed. The Erli were destroyed in 493 BC, the Vandals were destroyed in 534, and the Ostrogoths were destroyed in 538 AD. Now remember that time, 538 AD, because we're, that's going to come up here in a few minutes. So we see the Bible clearly predicted that these ten kingdoms were going to rise up out of the Roman Empire and that three of them were going to be destroyed by this little horn power. That's one clue that we can use to identify this little horn power. It also says that this little horn power in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. We can see here that this little horn power gets its leadership from an individual. Anytime you see this little horn power, the Bible refers to it as an individual, not as a group. So it's going to get its vision, its, its commands from one individual. So, remember I told you that the devil was going to use this little horn power to attack God's heavenly sanctuary and attack each article of furniture in the sanctuary and the significance that it brings out. And that's what this little horn power does. Let me show you from the scriptures. You see, in Daniel 8.11 it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of hosts. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Now, which article of furniture would have to do with, with sacrifices? Pretty simple here. Somebody select one. The altar of sacrifice, right? You see, when it says, the Bible says that this little horn tower, the power would take away sacrifice. That's an attack on the altar of sacrifice. And the altar of sacrifice is significant of what? Death. Jesus' death on the cross. So let's look at the next verse. Oh, now think, I'm sorry, think about this. If there's no more sacrifice, then there's no need for the priest to wash their hands in the laver. If there's no sacrifice of Jesus, then there's nothing for us to be baptized into. So by doing this, it also took away the significance of the labor. Now let's look at Daniel 8.12. It says, talking about this little horn power again, it says, And a host was given, uh, given him against the daily sacrifice by the reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Now which article of furniture would be represented by truth? The Bible says that thy word is truth. The table of showbread is the representation of the Bible. This little horn power is going to attack the Bible or the table of showbread. Daniel 8.11, it also told us that he is going to magnify himself even to the prince of hosts. Now, this one will be easier to understand after I reveal to you who this little horn power is. But you see, this, this little horn power is going to place himself in the position of God. And specifically in the position of God in the way we do our prayers and when we, the way we do our confessions. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. But what article of furniture has to do with prayer? Altar of incense. And we see that the little horn power is going to attack altar of incense. It's going to attack the significance of prayer. It also says, remember Daniel 7.25, it says that he was going to wear out the saints of the Most High. What would represent God's people, the saints? The seven branch candlestick. You see, this little horn power is going to attack God's people. He's going to attack the gospel. He's going to try to put out the light of the gospel. It's going to be an attack on the seven branch candlestick. It also says that he thinks to change times and laws. And this is pretty easy. There's only one left. What is this an attack on? Remember, the Ark of the Covenant is a symbolic re representation of God's law. This is an attack on God's law. It also tells us a couple more characteristics. 8.24 it says that this little horn power will, will be mighty. It also tells us that he shall destroy many. So we have quite a few 
uh, distinguishing marks to help us identify who this little horn, little horn power is. And this is just for Daniel chapter 7 and 8. There's actually many other places in the Bible that add more detail to identify who this little horn power is. But let's review what we've covered so far. You see, this little horn power is going to arise out of the kingdom of Rome after the 4th century because it came in after the little horn power. I'm sorry, it came in after the ten kings came on the scene. And it says it's going to attack God's people for 1260 consecutive years. And it says it's going to have its vision and its leadership from an individual. And it's going to take away the importance of Jesus' sacrifice. And it's going to attack the Bible. And it's going to remove the, it's going to magnify itself to be equal with God. And it's going to persecute God's saints. And it's going to attempt to change times and laws. And it's going to have great power. And it's going to destroy many people. So we see here clearly there's ten very distinctive marks that are going to help us identify who this little horn power is. Now what do you think the chances are that some group of people in the history of this world would accidentally fill all ten of these marks? It's probably not very likely. It's about as likely as the theory of evolution. So if you believe the theory of evolution, then you may believe that this is just a coincidence as well. But I believe it's very clear. Now, I'm about to share with you exactly who this little horn power is, but before I explain to you who it is, I want to be very careful here because I want to be very clear that what I'm about to share with you is in no way intended to be an attack on any individual. What I'm about to share with you may come across as perhaps controversial, maybe even offensive to somebody that's listening to me. And I in no way intend to attack individuals. I don't personally believe in mocking or criticizing other people's faith. However, I do believe very, very strongly in exposing errors uncovering the devil's deceptions, uncovering biblical truths. And because of that, that is the reason why I'm willing to share with you who this little horn power represents. This little horn power is none other than a prophetic representation of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, before you turn me off, before you tune me out or get angry with me, give me a second to explain. You see, first of all, I have a lot of respect for the Catholic Church today. You see, the humanitarian work that the Catholic Church does in our world is spectacular. It's amazing. And I have no doubt in my mind that since the foundation of the Catholic Church, this world has been full of sincere, faithful, devoted Catholics that love the Lord God with all their heart and have dedicated their lives to God. And in my personal opinion, I believe, and I can't prove one way or another, but it's my personal opinion that there will be more Catholics in the kingdom of heaven than any other religious group in the history of this world. So I'm not anti-Catholic. But I am about exposing errors and presenting biblical truths. And that is why I want to share with you who this little horn power represents. And you see, it's unfortunate that the Catholic Church was the first Christian denomination. And you know the devil was bound and determined to do an all-out attack on God's people and God's church. And you see, he tried to physically destroy Christians for nearly 300 years, but he couldn't physically destroy them. The more he persecuted them, the more the Christian faith grew. He realized that he had to change his tactics, so he switched to what he knows best, deception. He began to introduce deceptions into the Christian church, and he began attacking God's people and the Holy Sanctuary through deceptions. Now we're going to look at how this Roman Catholic Church has fulfilled all these attacks on the articles of furniture in the sanctuary. So we see the altar of sacrifice. How did the Catholic Church affect our understanding of Jesus' death on the cross? Well, you see, they acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross. But you see, they're, they're not agreeing with the fact that Jesus' death covered all of our sins because the, the devil introduced something to confuse Christians through the Catholic Church. He introduced the ideal of indulgences and penances. The ideal that somebody could buy their way out of sinful punishments. The ideal that somebody could do crazy things to earn their way out of punishment. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see anywhere in the Bible that talks anything about buying our way out of our sins. Our sins are only forgiven by the, Jesus dying on the cross. Amen? Amen? See, by adding these penances and these indulgences, they're taking away the significance of Jesus' death. The laver. How did they attack the laver? Remember, the laver is symbolic of baptism. Well, you see, the Catholics, they saw, they believed that when people were born, we were born into sin, and that is absolutely true. And they saw that these infant babies were being born, and and they didn't have the health care that we have today and it wasn't uncommon for infants to die and they were afraid that if they died before they were baptized then they were going to go straight to hell and spend eternity in hell as an infant and that was a very scary sight so they came up with an idea they said well, we're just going to start baptizing babies we're going to start baptizing infants and of course you can't do the biblical form of baptism you don't want to dunk the baby in the water and bring it back up so they just simply started sprinkling the children and this became so efficient 
that they could baptize groups of large people so fast just by sprinkling instead of the dunking that they just made this their form of baptism. And you see they at attacked the, the way the Bible tells us to be baptized. Now that may not seem like a lot, but when you start thinking about the significance of the way we're baptized, you see we go under the water signifying our belief that Jesus died for us. Then we come up out of the water signifying our new birth, our spiritual new birth. And you see, this act of baptism is simply an outward display of something that's going on inside. You see, the real true baptism comes in the heart. It comes when we acknowledge that we're a sinner and that we need Jesus as our Savior. Now, an infant, a child, cannot logically understand their sins, can they? So you see, the devil attacked the, our understanding of how we do baptism through the Catholic Church. Now, the table of showbread, the Bible, it's very clear in Catholic history that the Catholics kept the Bible away from the common people. They banned the Bible from their people. People could be thrown in prison or killed for owning a Bible. They said that the Bible was too confusing and only trained priests could understand and interpret the Bible. They took away the significance of the table of showbread. And then the altar of incense. Now, you see, if you think about the sanctuary structure, it's a two-compartment room with a curtain in the middle. You have the, Ark of the, I mean, you have the altar of incense on one side. You have the mercy seat on the other side. Now, I think of a Catholic confessional booth. You see, we're supposed to confess our sins to God through prayer. But you see, they set up a two-room compartment with a curtain on one side, and where the mercy seat's supposed to be, they put the priest. And you see, the people are confessing their sins to the priest. They're tacking away the significance of our confession, our prayer to God. And they also encourage prayer to Mary and all the saints as well. So they took away our understanding of prayer. And then the seven-branch candlestick. Now, there's a dark history of persecution the Catholic Church persecuted heretics, those that didn't believe the same way that they did. And I don't want to look into that because the Protestant history has as much evil persecution as the Christian, uh, I mean, as the uh, Catholic history. But I just want to point out that the Bible predicted that this, the little horn power, the Roman Catholic Church, was going to do persecution. And then the last article of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the Catholic Church changed God's laws. And I want to show you what the, the Catholic dictionary tells, how, what power this Pope has. This is taken from the Ecclesiastical D Dictionary. It says, The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, change, or interpret even divine laws. The, the Pope can modify divine laws since his power is not of man but of God. He acts as a vicegerent of God upon the earth with the most ample power of binding and losing, loosing his sheep. You see, the Catholic Church claims that the Pope is equal with God here on earth, that he has the power to change God's laws. Now, how did they change God's law? Well, remember, it said that he thought to change times and laws. Now, if we look at a Catholic catechism and we compare the Catholic Ten Commandments to a biblical Ten Commandments, the first thing we notice is that the Second Commandment, that we shouldn't have any graven images, that we shouldn't worship idols, that's completely rem removed from the Catechism's Ten Commandments. And logically that would make sense because the Catholic churches are full of statues that they pray to. They encourage prayer to Mary and to the statues of the saints. And then to, to make up for losing a commandment, they came down to the Tenth Commandment. And the Tenth Commandment says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maid ser manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is of thy neighbor's. You see, they took this Tenth Commandment and they divided it in half and made two commandments. They said, they said, uh, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Because they had to come up with somewhere. So we can clearly see that they changed laws. But what about this time? Did they change time? What law has to do with time in God's Ten Commandments? The Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath. They removed the word Sabbath. Now, to people that don't understand the significance of the Sabbath, and it may not be a big deal to you. But you see, to take the word Sabbath out of the Fourth Commandment and say it's the Lord's Day, and then complain that the Lord's Day is Sunday, this is what the Bible would call blasphemy. And you see, the, the Catholic Church is, I'm sorry, the Catholic Church is not ashamed of doing this. This is an article that was taken from a very dominant Catholic magazine in 1995. And I highlighted this one section here so we can read it. It says, Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The day of the Lord was chosen, not from any direction of Scripture, note that, but from the church's sense of its own power. They believed that they had the power to change times and laws. 
And you see, the day of resurrection, the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, came on the first day of the week. So this would be the new Sabbath. People who think that Scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists. So they're saying here in this article, if you want to follow the Bible and the Bible alone, then you need to be going to church on Saturday. If you go to church on Sunday, you're acknowledging the fact that the Pope has the power to change the Holy Day. Now, what I'm sharing with you is not a new teaching. You see, for hundreds of years, since the beginning of the, what the history calls the Protestant Reformation, history tells us that all Protestant Christians understood the position that the Catholic Church was in, the position that the Pope was in. And you see, they applied the word Antichrist to the Pope. Anti means against, against Christ. You see, the Pope was putting himself in the position of God and giving himself the authority of God. Notice this article from a book, All Roads Lead to Rome. It says, Wycliffe, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin, Craner, in the 17th century, Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Riley, Dr. Moy Lloyd-Jones, these men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. You see, this teaching I'm sharing with you is not anything new. It's only in the last 150 years that the devil has tried to cover up this history, this truth, again. And I believe the 17th century theologian described it best, Cotton Mather. He said, "...the oracles of God foretold the rising of an Antichrist in the Christian church. And in the Pope of Rome, all the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered that if any who read the Scriptures do not see it, there is a marvelous blindness upon them." He's saying if you study the Scriptures and you don't see that the, the Pope and the Catholic Church are this Antichrist power, this power that's going against God's laws and changing up God's things, if you don't see that this is the Catholic Church and the Pope, then you're blind. You're blinded by the devil's deceptions. Now, what about this 1260-year time period? Now, remember, I told you that the last little horn that was destroyed, that last kingdom that was destroyed, happened in 538 A.D. We also see in 538 A.D. a very significant decree went forth. The Emperor of Rome, Justinian, decreed that the Bishop of Rome, who was uh, Pope Villagus at that time, was to be head over all the church. It, become, it became official that the Pope, his position, was now pure authority over all the Catholic Church. And at this point, 538 A.D., the Little Horn was given its full power. Now, if we understand this right, then if this 538 A.D. is the start of this 1260-year period. And if we follow 1260 years later, that brings us to 1798. So if we understand prophecy correctly, then a very significant event is going to take place in 1798. And if any of y'all are history buffs, you may remember that there was a man named Napoleon. And he sent his general, Berthier, in 1798, they marched into Rome, and they took the Pope out of his position and said that he had no authority anymore. They completely removed the Christian faith and said, we're not going to have a Christian religion here anymore. And you see, for 1260 years, the Pope had the authority over all the church. Now, we know today that the Pope has been given back that authority. But this 1260-year period covered from 538 A.D. to 1798. And let me end with this. You see, Daniel 8, 13 and 14, Daniel has a conversation with an angel. And in this conversation goes like this. He asked the angel, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto them, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. You see, Daniel is saying here, God, how long are you going to allow this little horn power to attack God's sanctuary? And how long are you going to allow him to attack God's people? How long are you going to allow him to attack God's law. And he answered and said, Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed. My friends, you don't want to miss BBOS part 4, the cleansing of the sanctuary. How will God's sanctuary be cleansed? What does that mean? When is this going to take place? You'll see all this in BBOS part 4. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for giving us prophecy in your word. It's like a road map that leads us it shows us that you are in control and you know everything that's going to happen, whether it's good or bad. 
We see that you're in control. And Lord, we thank you for giving us not only prophecy to understand the past, but also prophecy to understand the future. As we, under, as we continue to study this BBOS story, may we all be able to see how you've led us and how you're going to lead us in the future. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and I pray this in his, most, in his precious holy name. Amen.